Happy Monday, sweet Mitchell Mustangs. It's April 6th. I am so happy that we are together again this Monday. And please make sure that you have read the letter that is on our Canvas page. It's the updated letter with our new extension that of uh, the online classroom platform, knowing that we will not come back together face-to-face -to -face on the 13th, but later in the year in May. So with that little shift, all of the language arts teachers, we are asking that every student sends us an email. In the subject, have your name and your block number. In the content, send us one grade for each week. So one grade for week one from your reader's response, one grade from week two for your reader's response, and one grade for week three for your reader's response. So obviously you won't send week three until later this week, but it is would be great if you would send week one and week two. If you would like to send us the one reader's response that matches the grade that you're sending, that's fine. If you cannot send it, just save it at home and just send the number grade. So at the very least, send us a number grade because you have your, your rubric and you know how to do this. This is something we've been doing all year long in the language arts department where we have our mini lesson and our read aloud. We read independently, we respond to our reading, and we're always using rubrics to self-assess and discuss areas where we can grow. So thank you for doing that. So today, what I'd like us to talk about is plot structure. And we know we're inside of a fiction book and we are about halfway through with Charlotte's Web. So the plot structure is there to help us to follow along this fiction book. So we will have an introduction and we know the introduction was very exciting. It was when we were introduced to Mr. and Mrs. Arable and Fern, and Fern saved Wilbur. That was the introduction. And so now we're in the rising actions where things are happening. Wilbur moves to the barn. Wilbur finds out what the plans are for Christmas. Charlotte becomes a wonderful friend to Wilbur. In fact, all the animals, besides Templeton, even though Templeton does do some things to help, it's not so much out of friendship. But all the animals come together for a meeting that Charlotte leads, and they have this plan, and Charlotte is now making her web to have these beautiful words to describe Wilbur. So these are all rising actions, which will get us to, which we haven't hit yet, what we call the climax. The moment in the story where we're oh, sort of takes our breath away. And then the falling actions are things that sort of tie together the story into what we call then a resolution or a denouement. And the reason why we don't call it a solution when we get to fifth and sixth grade is because lots of things happen in the books that we read that just can't be resolved or, or so, just can't have a solution, should I say. They can have a resolution, meaning the characters come to some way to terms with whatever has happened. So there really is a difference between a solution and a resolution. In Knuffle Bunny, one of my favorite picture books, there is a solution in the end, meaning that the little girl finds her bunny. And so that's a solution. It's all put together and it's, it's done. The books that you're reading, the books that I'm reading in Charlotte's Web, we anticipate real life issues to happen. And it's more about how everybody comes to terms with it. So it is quite a difference. And, and I really enjoy the resolution part because I enjoy seeing how an author has crafted together the story to make things right at the end. So let's read we'll move into back into Charlotte's Web. I'm so excited that we're reading again because we haven't been together for a few days. Dr. Dorian. The next day was Saturday. Fern stood at the kitchen sink drying the breakfast dishes as her mother washed them. Mrs. Arable worked silently. 
She hoped Fern would go out and play with other children instead of heading for the Zuckerman's barn to sit and watch the animals. Charlotte is the best storyteller I ever heard, said Fern, poking her dish towel into a cereal bowl. Fern, said her mother sternly, you must not invent things. You know spiders don't tell stories. Spiders can't talk. Charlotte can, said Fern. She doesn't talk very loud, but she talks. What kind of story did she tell? asked Mrs. Arable. Well, began Fern, she told us about a cousin of hers who caught a fish in her web. Don't you think that's fascinating? Fern, dear, how would a fish get into a spider's web? said Mrs. Arable. You know it couldn't happen. You're making this up. <gasps> Oh, it happened all right, replied Fern. Charlotte never fibs. This cousin of hers built a web across a stream. One day she was hanging around on the web and a tiny fish leaped into the air and got tangled in the web. The fish was caught by one fin. Mother, its tail was wildly thrashing and shining in the sun. Can't you just see the web sagging dangerously under the weight of the fish? Charlotte's cousin kept slipping in, dodging out, and she was beaten mercilessly over the head by the wildly thrashing fish, dancing in and dancing out, throwing. Fern, snapped her mother. Stop it. Stop inventing these wild tales. I'm not inventing, said Fern. I'm just telling you the facts. What finally happened, asked her mother, whose curiosity did begin to get the better of her. Charlotte's cousin won. She wrapped the fish up, then she ate him. When she got good and ready, spiders have to eat, the same as the rest of us. Yes, I suppose they do, said Mrs. Arable vaguely. Charlotte has another cousin who is a balloonist. She stands on her head, lets out a lot of line, and is carried aloft on the wind. Mother, wouldn't you simply love to do that? Yes, I would come to think of it, replied Mrs. Arable. But Fern, darling, I wish you would play outdoors today instead of going to Uncle Homer's barn. Find some of your playmates and do something nice outdoors. You're spending too much time in that barn. It isn't good for you to be alone so much. Alone? said Fern. Alone? My best friends are in the barn cellar. It's a very sociable place. Not at all lonely. Fern disappeared after a while, walking down the road toward Zuckerman's. Her mother dusted the sitting room. As she worked, she kept thinking about Fern. It didn't seem natural for a little girl to be so interested in animals. Finally, Mrs. Arable made up her mind she would pay a call on old Dr. Dorian and ask his advice. She got in the car and drove to his office in the village. Dr. Dorian had a thick beard. He was glad to see Mrs. Arable and gave her a comfortable chair. It's about Fern, she explained. Fern spends entirely too much time in the Zuckerman's barn. It doesn't seem normal. She sits on a milk stool in a corner of a barn cellar near the pig pen and watches animals hour after hour. She just sits and listens. Dr. Dorian leaned back and closed his eyes. How enchanting, he said. It must be real nice and quiet down there. Homer has some sheep, hasn't he? Yes, said Mrs. Arable, but it all started with that pig we let Fern raise on a bottle. She calls him Wilbur. Homer bought the pig, and ever since it left our place, Fern has been going to her uncle's to be near it. I've been hearing things about the pig, said Dr. Dorian, opening his eyes. They say he's quite a pig. Have you heard about the words that appeared in the spider's web? asked Mrs. Arable nervously. Yes, replied the doctor. Well, do you understand it? asked Mrs. Arable. Understand what? 
Do you understand how there could be any writing in a spider's web? Oh no, said Dr. Dorian. I don't understand it. But for that matter, I don't understand how a spider learned to spin a web in the first place. When the words appeared, everyone said they were a miracle. But nobody pointed out the web itself is a miracle. What's miraculous about a spider's web? said Mrs. Arable. I don't see why you say a web is a miracle. It's just a web. Ever try to spin one? asked Dr. Dorian. Mrs. Arable shifted uneasily in her chair. N no, she said, but I can crochet a dolly and I can knit a sock. Sure, said the doctor, but somebody taught you, didn't they? My mother taught me. Well, who taught a spider? A spider knows how to spin a web without any instructions from anybody. Don't you regard that a miracle? I suppose so, said Mrs. Arable. I never looked at it that way before. Still, I don't understand how those words got into the web. I don't understand it, and I don't like what I can't understand. <sighs> None of us do, said Dr. Dorian, sighing. I'm a doctor. Doctors are supposed to understand everything. But I don't understand everything, and I don't intend to let it worry me. Mrs. Arable fidgeted. Fern says the animals talk to each other. Dr. Dorian, do you believe animals talk? I never heard one say anything, replied Dr. Dorian. But that proves nothing. It is quite possible that an animal has spoken civilly to me and that I didn't catch the remark because I wasn't paying attention. Children pay better attention than grown-ups. If Fern says that that animal in Zuckerman's barn is talking, I'm quite ready to believe her. Perhaps if people talked less, animals would talk more. People are incessant talkers. I can give you my word on that. Well, I feel better about Fern, said Mrs. Arable. You don't think I need to worry about her? Does she look well? asked the doctor. Oh yes. Appetite good? Oh yes, she's always hungry. Sleep well at night? Oh yes. Then don't worry, said the doctor. Do you think she'll ever start thinking about something besides pigs and sheep and geese and spiders? How old is Fern? She's eight. Well, said Dr. Dorian, I think she will always love animals, but I doubt that she spends her entire life in Homer Zuckerman's barn cellar. How about boys? Does she know any boys? She knows Henry Fussy, said Mrs. Arable brightly. Dr. Dorian closed his eyes again and went into his deep thought. Henry Fussy, he mumbled. Hmm, remarkable. Well, I don't think you have anything to worry about. Let Fern associate with her friends in the barn if she wants to. I would say offhand that spiders and pigs were fully as interesting as Henry Fussy. Yet I predict the day will come when even Henry will drop some chance remark that catches Fern's attention. It's amazing how children change from year to year. How's Avery? He asked, opening his eyes wide. Oh, Avery, chuckled Mrs. Arable. Avery is always very fine. Of course, he gets into poison ivy and gets stung by wasps and bees and brings frogs and snakes home and breaks everything, everything he lays his hands on. He's fine. Good, said the doctor. Mrs. Arable said goodbye and thanked Dr. Dorian very much for his advice. She felt greatly relieved. The Crickets the crickets sang in the grasses. They sang the song of summer's ending, a sad, monotonous song. Summer is over and gone, they sang, over and gone, over and gone. Summer is dying and dying. The crickets felt it was their duty to warn everybody that summertime cannot last forever. 
Even on the most beautiful days in the whole year, the days when summer is changing into fall, the crickets spread the rumor of sadness and change. Everybody heard the song of the crickets. Avery and Fern Arable heard it as they walked the dusty road. They knew that school would begin soon. The young geese heard it and knew that they would never be little goslings again. Charlotte heard it and knew that she hadn't much time left. Mrs. Zuckerman, at work in the kitchen, heard the crickets, and a sadness came over her too. Another summer gone, she said. Lurvy, at work building a crate for Wilbur, heard the song and knew that it was time to dig potatoes. Summer is over and gone, repeated the crickets. How many nights till frost, sang the crickets. Goodbye, summer, goodbye, summer, goodbye, goodbye. The sheep heard the crickets, and they felt so uneasy, they broke a hole in the pasture fence and wandered up into the field across the road. The gander discovered the hole and led his family through, and they walked to the orchard and ate the apples that were lying on the ground. A little maple tree in the swamp heard the cricket song and turned bright red with anxiety. Wilbur was now the center of attraction on the farm. Good food and regular hours were showing results. Wilbur was a pig any, any man would be proud of. One day, more than a hundred people came to stand at his yard and admire him. Charlotte had written the word radiant. And Wilbur really looked radiant as he stood in the golden sunlight. Ever since the spider had befriended him, he had done his best to live up to his reputation. When Charlotte's web said some pig, Wilbur had tried hard to look like some pig. When Charlotte's web said terrific, Wilbur had tried to look terrific. And now that the web said radiant, he did everything possible to make himself glow. It is not easy to look radiant, but Wilbur threw himself into it with a will. He would turn his head slightly and blink his long eyelashes. Then he would breathe deeply, and when his audience grew bored, he would spring into the air and do a backflip with a half twist. At this, the crowd would yell and cheer. How's that for a pig? Mr. Zuckerman would ask, well pleased with himself. That pig is radiant. Some of Wilbur's friends in the barn worried for fear all this attention would go to his head and make him stuck up, but it never did. Wilbur was modest, fame did not spoil him. He still worried some about the future as he could hardly believe that a mere spider would be able to save his life. Sometimes at night, he would have a bad dream. He would dream that men were coming to get him with knives and guns, but that was only a dream. In the daytime, Wilbur usually felt happy and confident. No pig ever had truer friends, and he realized that friendship is one of the most satisfying things in the world. Even the song of the crickets did not make Wilbur too sad. He knew it was almost time for the county fair, and he was looking forward to the trip. If he could distinguish himself at the fair and maybe win some prize money, he was sure Zuckerman would let him live. Charlotte had worries of her own, but she kept quiet about them. One morning, Wilbur asked her about the fair. You're going with me, aren't you, Charlotte? He asked. Well... I don't know, replied Charlotte. The fair comes at a bad time for me. I shall find it inconvenient to leave home, even for a few days. Why? asked Wilbur. Oh, I just don't feel like leaving my web. Too much going on around here. Please come with me, Wilbur begged. I need you, Charlotte. I can't stand going to that fair without you. You're, you'll, you, you just got to come. No, said Charlotte. I believe I'd better stay home and see if I can't get some work done. What kind of work, asked Wilbur. Egg laying. 
It's time I made an egg sack and filled it with eggs. I didn't know you could lay eggs, said Wilbur in amazement. Oh, sure, said the spider. spider. I'm versatile. What does versatile mean? Full of eggs? asked Wilbur. Oh, certainly not, said Charlotte. Versatile means I can turn with ease from one thing to another. It means I don't have to limit my activities to spinning and trapping and stunts like that. Why don't you come with me to the fairgrounds and lay your eggs there, pleaded Wilbur. It would be wonderfully fun. Charlotte gave her web a twitch and moodily watched it sway. I'm afraid not, she said. You don't know the first thing about egg laying, Wilbur. I can't arrange my family duties to suit the management of the county fair. When I get ready to lay eggs, I have to lay eggs, fair or no fair. However, I don't want you to worry about it. You might lose weight. We'll leave it this way. I'll come to the fair if I possibly can. <gasps> oh, good, said Wilbur. I knew you wouldn't forsake me just when I needed you most. All that day, Wilbur stayed inside, taking life easy in the straw. Charlotte rested and ate a grasshopper. She knew that she couldn't help Wilbur much longer. In a few days, she would have to drop everything and build the beautiful little sack that would hold her eggs. Mitchell Mustangs, what a beautiful story we are in the middle of. So when we think about the plot structure, there are things that are happening that are getting us to that aha moment. And what I like to say to my own LC is that these important moments on the plot structure are what push the story forward. It has to happen for the story to move forward. Chapters like what we just read today make the story interesting. So the whole visit with Dr. Dorian just makes the story more understandable that Fern has this mother that loves her and is very concerned with her. And Dr. Dorian is saying, don't worry, I wish we could all listen to animals. That chapter doesn't have to be inside of this story. However, it's really interesting to read. It's the beauty of the story of making those important moments that push the story forward more understandable and more interesting. So today, Mitchell Mustangs, as you read in your independent reading book, think about how fiction has this plot structure that helps us to follow along and what part of your story are you inside of right now? Are you inside of the introduction, moving into the rising actions? Are you about to get to the climax? Or are you in the other side of the climax where the story is tying things up? where there's re a resolution that's being created that makes the story feel that it can come to an end. So the last thing that I want to say to you today is thank you so much for joining me and stay healthy, happy reading, and happy writing, Sweet Mitchell Mustangs. See you tomorrow.